Christopher? Robert. How are you? Ah, a bit early to say. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so you probably need no introduction, right? I mean, uh, you, you're a columnist at Slate and Vanity Fair and author of God is Not Great, among uh, other books. But um, is there anything else you want to say? No, that will do it. You think so? Yeah. Uh, so, oh, well, uh, paperback of God is Not Great, available at fine bookstores everywhere. I'm sorry, I left that part off. I don't know. Uh, maybe because it wasn't my book, I, I forgot that part. The... Um, so, uh, after many years, I finally made your acquaintance uh, at uh, La Ciudad de las Ideas in Puebla, Mex Mexico, uh, a few weeks ago. And I guess that's one factor that led to this happening. Um, and I gather the idea, well, if I don't know who does, but I think the idea is that uh, we're going to talk about foreign policy, and then we're going we're gonna to have a second discussion um, about religion. Is, is that your understanding? That was what I was told, sure. And I guess there are some differences between my views on foreign policy and yours, uh, which certainly came to my attention during the Iraq War, and maybe at some point we should talk about that. Uh, is there anything you want to say by way of characterizing our differences or anything else? The differences uh, between us, which I, I, I'm pluralizing on purpose, um, I think became manifest specifically in what you wrote about Major Hassan's attack on his uh, fellow soldiers of Fort Hood. Right. And in particular, uh, you're saying that it, it should lead us to a, a greater understanding of religious rage. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, I don't, we obviously can't assume, can we, that our audience already knows no. how should we rehearse that. So shall I just say what, why I thought you were wrong? Well, can I, let, me, let me say what I think. Well, why don't you say was. what you thought first? Yes, that's better. I, 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 I think I was just making uh, the point that, um, given that everyone seems to agree that uh, among the factors that drove him over the edge was his, uh, his outrage over the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, whatever, however unstable he was to begin with, for whatever reasons of personal circumstance, um, that one, one thing to keep in mind about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars was that they, uh, this is a potential cost of them to, uh, you know, to push, to push people perhaps disposed to radical uh, Islamism over the edge. Um, and, and more broadly, uh, I said that really th this, this, this particular dynamic was consistent with what I think had been the kind of the left-wing view of the war on terror to begin with. At least it was a view that I espoused, which was that you shouldn't focus so much on killing the terrorists that you spread the terrorist meme, which I would say uh, is what we, we did in this case. So that's, uh, that's kind of my argument. Well, perhaps paradoxically, I, I'd want to start by agreeing with you. I mean, at least you didn't make any bones about the Islamist element in Major Hassan's actions, if you recall, there was at least a week where everyone was trying to find out any other explanation than that, uh, including quite senior people in the armed forces. They said, the, the, okay, this terrible thing's happened. The first thing we must do is not find that it's related to his religion. Uh, the president seemed to imply that in what he said. It took about a week before it was very clear. Yes, he had charged Rahu Akbar. Yes, he'd bought the weapon off base a long time before. Yes, he'd been in touch with Imam al-Alaki, a very dangerous person wanted in connection uh, with the 9-11 hijackers who were his friends. And, and yes, it turned out to be true that a few weeks before the atrocity at Fort Hood, Imam al-Alaki had given a general theocratic permission uh, on his website and in his broadcast for attacks on American soldiers anywhere. So, I mean, I, I think the presumption of guilt is in, the, in respect of Major Hassan's fanaticism is pretty high. So to that extent, we agree. Good. Um, <clears throat> now let me put the case <clears throat> of um, Sergeant Papadopoulos, uh, a soldier from Chicago of Greek-American ancestry. Um, the, the island of Cyprus has been under Turkish military occupation now for a lot, a lot of years, ever since 1974. Partition, occupation, expulsion of Greeks... Uh, the United States has a very warm military relationship with Turkey. Are you telling me that if Sergeant Papadopoulos was suddenly to pack a clip into his gun and spray everyone around him on base, that this would be a wake-up call for our understanding that Greeks feel really very strongly indeed about Turkish imperialism? I don't think you'd do any such thing. 
There's a special privilege given to religious fanaticism in these cases, and I think it should be stopped. Uh, I'm not sure I, I even literally I think heard religious, everything. I think, I think religious fanaticism, in other words, makes it worse, not better. And the second thing is, if you're looking for how to diagnose Muslim outrage, once you start, you can't stop. I mean, what will it be this time? Will it be a cartoon in an obscure newspaper in Denmark? Leads to riots and killings and burnings and lynchings all around the world. Who would have known that was going to happen? A, 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 a rumor printed in Newsweek about the defacement of a Quran in at Guantanamo Bay leads to violence. Um, the sight of women unveiled uh, can lead to violence. Um, the existence of homosexuals or Jews can lead to Muslim violence. If you want to take out an insurance policy and say, let's not do anything to upset these people, there's, there won't be anything much you can do, not in remain as you are, at any rate, on the liberal left, because everything that you care about the most, the tolerance, uh, tolerance of sexual uh, diversity, uh, emancipation of women, protection of the Jewish people from genocidal threats, right of newspapers to publish cartoons and editorials, all of that's gone because you can't be too careful. This is no way to live, and I won't live like that for a minute. Uh, well, you don't have to worry about me living that way for a minute either. Uh, I mean, you've, you've successfully carried my logic to an extreme that goes well beyond where I would have taken it. So we don't have to worry about... Not an extreme. I think, I think we don't have you're, to worry you're about logical... saying you, you shouldn't stop genocide because it may offend someone. Uh, but, but if we could get back to where we started before this... this uh, pretty epic extrapolation. Um, do you agree with me that, uh, that we can say that this is a cost of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars in this one case, uh, and not the only one actually on American soil, uh, and may be uh, something generically to worry about? Do you think it exemplifies a cost? I mean, I think you'd agree that before we launch wars, uh, to the extent that we can, we should do a kind of a cost-benefit analysis, um, or maybe you disagree. But, but, but do you agree that we've just seen a cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, the 9-11 hijackers and the Al-Qaeda cells were in the United States well before the United States was in Afghanistan or Iraq. Right. The Taliban had taken over Afghanistan, banned music, right. banned women from appearing in public, right. uh, found, found new and even more cruel ways of executing homosexuals. Right and issued proclamations calling for the death of all Jews and all Hindus and all right. secularists long before the United States. Right, so we can exclude no, in other words, the hypothesis. You know, I flat out, I flat we, we out can disagree with you. It, Islamic extremism, Islamic fascistic rhetoric and behavior is not created by the resistance to it, no. All, the, ev all the evidence we, we have is, is to the contrary. <clears throat> Right. Not, not every instance of it uh, is caused by that. Does that mean to you that not any instance of it could be caused by that? That, that would seem strange to me. Well, I have no doubt that the latest Taliban attack on a girls' school in Afghanistan is motivated in their minds by the presence of American troops in the country and certainly justified by them in public that way. But believe me, they'd be throwing acid in the faces of unveiled girls trying to go to school, well, whether we were there or not. So well, no, actually, no. Actually, it, 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 this is not produced by our resistance to it. Actually, the evidence is all to the contrary. In all the sermons of Osama bin Laden that were broadcast and that mm -hmm. we have easy access to before... Uh, the horrific attack on our civil society in September of 2001, all of those celebrate American weakness. They say, we will win because. You notice how the United States has scuttled from Somalia. They're retreating all around uh -huh. the world. Their country is run by feminists and Jews and queers. Uh, defeating them will be simple. They, they, th their rallying call was that America is weak, not that it's prepared to fight. Christopher, I'm willing to concede that doing nothing ever militarily could have that downside. Okay, I'm just asking, are you willing to concede what seems to me obvious, that the Iraq War, which you championed, and, and, and the Afghanistan War, had at least this one downside? You're denying it? As I understand your argument, what you're saying is, wait, there was Islamist terrorism before the Iraq War, so it's impossible that any manifestation of Islamist terrorism could have been caused by the Iraq War. Is that, is that your position? The, the thing itself is not created by the Iraq War, is my position. Now, you're, you're dealing with something I know you well enough to know, not just from meeting you, but from your writings, you recognize as a fallacy, which is that of post hoc propter hoc. I suppose it could be argued that the decision by Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia to blow up the most sacred shrine 
of the Shia people, the, the Golden Dome Mosque in Samarra, might not have occurred if there were no American forces in the country. That's possible, but I think it's unlikely because there are many countries where there are no American forces, such as uh, Pakistan, for example, where the al-Qaeda extremists blow up Sunni mosques as a matter of principle. Wait, you, you think uh, that, the, that... The, the, the Hazara people of Afghanistan, the Shia population who were partly ethnically Persian, for example, were, were nearly destroyed uh, under Taliban rule. In fact, at one point, Iran itself was considering invading Afghanistan to put a stop to that religious, clerical, ethnic atrocity until President Clinton stopped them from crossing the border. So, no, in, in no significant extent to no significant extent, is this religious terrorism attributable to our decision to fight against it? Uh, well, if you think that mosque would have been blown up anyway, even if we had not invaded Iraq and Saddam Hussein had been allowed to maintain his iron grip on the country, I think it's safe to say you're in a minority, which I know is not a position you're afraid to be no, in. No, I'm but, not. But, but, I'm but, saying, but, no, you know, I, I, I actually said that I thought that, that particular one probably wouldn't have, but in general the decision to declare the Shia to be uh, heretics and uh, put to the sword um, precedes uh, our intervention there. Just as, for example, the decision of the um, Islamic insurgents in Algeria, where there were never any foreign troops, you know, to, you declare, to, to, to announce that anyone who didn't agree with them was under the, the precept of takfir, uh, excommunicated, um, uh, liable to death, uh, had nothing to do at all with the Western presence in the country. It was sui generis. You know, you, you mentioned um, uh, school opposition to the, the build, to, to letting girls uh, go to school and things like that in Afghanistan is one thing that incites uh, Islamism. The implication being that that, of course, doesn't mean we shouldn't champion it just because it incites radical Islamism. Um, there's there's a book uh, called Three Cups of Tea. Are you familiar with that by this guy Greg? It's Morrison or something who. Yes, I, I know of the book. I haven't read it. Very courageously has gone around Afghanistan building schools either mm. for girls or co-ed schools so that girls in Afghanistan can have an education. And if you read that book, and, and that book has actually been commended, I believe, to uh, American troops uh, or, or at least uh, uh, soldiers who are studying counterinsurgency doctrine by, by, I believe, General Petraeus. In any event, there's a good vignette in there of him showing a, 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 a moderate Muslim who is explaining how much damage the Iraq War did and the imagery generated by, by the Iraq War did uh, to, to his own desire to foster uh, moderation within Islam and what a handy tool it is for terrorist recruiters. Um, there's, there's, you know, it's probably... It sounds like you're willing to acknowledge... You're almost, trying you know, to apply, uh, Robert, you're trying to apply... Uh, reason and logic where it really doesn't work. A huge number of people have joined the jihad because they believe that the Israelis blew up the World Trade Center and that all the Jews left the World well, Trade Center just in time. I can't it, stop them from having that impression, but the impression they have uh -huh. comes not from any contact with reality or any reaction to objective circumstances, but from the belief in a fanatical religion. That's my first, last, and closing point on all of these things. Well, but it's an now, assertion. If, if, if there wasn't a, a bomb that had fallen on an Afghan wedding, say, due to the incompetence mm -hmm. of NATO and its refusal to commit ground troops, things of this kind, avoidable things, I'm sure the problem would be to that slight extent less. But in, in defining the problem, you're simply looking at the wrong diagnosis. You talk about Iraq. Um, the Kurdish people of Iraq, as you know, as everyone knows, were subjected to poison gas, uh, to chemical weaponry, to a, mm -hmm. an explicit <laughs> genocidal campaign, Quranically named, actually, by Saddam Hussein, the Anfal. It's a verse from the Quran about how you can plunder and destroy mm -hmm. people. Yep. Um, uh, deported, uh, fill in mass graves. Nothing, nothing was spared them. When a bomb goes off in well, Iraq, and, and in fact, when a bomb goes off in Iraq government. or anywhere else, I know, I know who it won't be. It will not be my Kurdish comrades who fought so hard for a free Iraq. They could claim justification for anything after what's been done to them. They don't do this kind of thing. And you discredit them when you say that, well, if you've suffered or if you think you're suffering or you've been insulted, you have the right to resort to violence. And if you no, do, no, no, no. it's See, our this fault. Is, Christopher, this is such a funda mis fundamental misunderstanding of what I'm saying. And I, you, you, you're I saying, wish it was. What you're saying, if, if I could talk for just a little while, what you're saying 
is that when I point to a downside of something we've done, I point to a cost incurred uh, by, by American action, including a crime that I'm saying was, was ultimately resulted from American action, in this case the murder of people at Fort Hood, what you're saying is that I'm justifying that murder and I'm assigning blame to America. And you I'm say, emphatically, I think I'm you not just only, said. Christopher, Christopher, I'm not only emphatically not doing that, I've repeatedly said I'm not doing that. And what you're doing is a favorite talking point on the right, which is whenever anyone points to an unfortunate consequence of, of American policy and suggests that maybe we should revise our thinking about that policy in light of the consequence, they say, oh, you're blaming America, you're blaming America. No, we're not, but saying we're blaming America is a very effective way, given human psychology, to shut off debate, intelligent debate entirely, which is what the American right wants, and which is the, the only effect of what you're doing. Um, when our viewers replay what you just said, I think they will hear you say that the murder by a man who'd sworn a Hippocratic oath of all his unarmed colleagues um, at Fort Hood was a consequence of American action. I, I, I believe that's I what you said. I think it would not have happened had we not launched those two wars. Uh, well, that's then, correct. all I wanted to do was to get you to say that. I'm, I'm content now. I, I think you've definitely made your point. I think there are all kinds of crimes that are committed that would not have committed, but for some circumstance. That doesn't mean it's a legally or morally mitigating circumstance. It oh, just means I'm sure you it's a want fact about the way causality works in the physical universe that things are that complex. And you to the extent you, that you, you can take this, that into account in your thinking about policy, I you, think you, you should. Regard this you think to, we you, shouldn't. You regard this to you as a physical law? Like, like, no, uh, I didn't say it was a physical law. You seem to imply it a second ago. Well, all physical. laws are grounded. I'm a materialist. All laws are grounded in the workings of the physical world. Yes, all causal well, laws, uh, yes. I, too, am a materialist. But Good. I also, and I'm very preoccupied for that reason with the question of whether or not we have free will, but there's certainly many people, uh, individuals and nations, who've been very badly maltreated, uh, who do not resort to sadistic violence and claim that God ordered them to undertake are. it. There certainly are, and there are people who smoke cigarettes and don't get lung cancer. Does that mean that cigarettes are not a contributing factor to lung cancer, and that they, in certain isolated cases, are what push the, the person over the edge into lung cancer? You're saying that's not the case? Again, I'm very happy just to have you say that. I, I, I couldn't make my point better. No, I think you made the opposite of your point. I think you made the opposite of your point. Very you're well. saying you're saying that if I can show someone uh, who, who was exposed to the type of circumstance that in one case uh, caused X, and it doesn't in this, in this case you point to cause X, then it can't be a contributing factor and can in no case cause X. That's what you're saying, and I'm saying no. The fact that cigarettes sometimes don't cause lung cancer doesn't mean that they don't in any individual. Good. Is that all? I win? No, no. I just, I just want everyone to hear you say all that. Okay. Uh, good. And, and they can replay it as often as they like. Now, do you want to talk about the Iraq War broadly? Sure. So, because I do think it's kind of, uh, it delimits our, our, uh, our world views pretty effectively. Um, but first of all, you don't agree with me, I gather, that in terms of international law, the Iraq War was a, was a pretty dubious enterprise. Well, international law itself in some areas is rather dubious, but there have been four, or vague, shall I, nebulous. Um, there are four conditions, it's generally thought, under which a state, a government, can lose its sovereignty. One is if it invades and occupies the territories of neighboring states. The other is if it commits genocide. That's if you're a signatory to the Genocide Convention, which we are. The third is violations of the, at least the spirit of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, in other words, fooling around with the legal acquisition of nuclear weapons. And the fourth is giving aid and comfort and hospitality to nihilistic international gangster groups. Now, Iraq was guilty of all four of those things on more than one occasion. It was a serial offender under all four. Hadn't been punished for them at the time it was doing them, but had put itself way outside the law. And after the uh, attempt to annex Kuwait to destroy a neighboring country, not just to occupy and invade it, but to abolish its existence, a member state of the UN and of the Arab League, signed uh, a ceasefire 
with the United States on, on condition of which its regime was allowed to retain power. Many of us thought at the time that was a mistake. It continued to violate all the terms of that ceasefire. Uh, it seems to me that it would have been a, a much better to have put an end to the Saddam Hussein regime in 1991. It would have spared the Iraqi people uh, some terrible years of suffering and misery. And it would have shown that the United Nations was serious about disciplining members that don't have any respect for international law. But if you believe that the only violations of international law uh, or the only important ones are, are committed by those who consider Saddam Hussein to be an outlaw, I, I certainly know where you're coming from. I'm familiar with that viewpoint. Well, so wait, you're saying there's, there's these four causes, four things that legitimize invasion or, yes. or at least strip a nation of its immunity to invasion. Yes. One of them is having invaded another country? Yes. You're talking about Kuwait? Kuwait and Iran. Well, okay, but I mean, you know, Kuwait, you know, of course, the and, Iran war... And I suppose, one, I suppose one might add the launching of indiscriminate missile attacks on the State of Israel, um, which was a non-combatant in the Kuwait war. Uh, during I the can Kuwait go on war. if you like about that. Okay, but uh, of course, the Kuwait war, I mean, that was the most recent infraction we're talking about. The, the Kuwait war had been literally dealt with under international law. The Security Council got together, rolled back the, address, the aggression, dropped a lot of bombs, killed a, ro a lot of Iraqi soldiers. It could have, if it wanted to, inflicted more punishment, but the body in charge of enforcing that bit of international law chose not to. And, yeah. on, and condition, so by, on, by on certain conditions that Iraq signed at the ceasefire agreement on the border, right. which, all of which it uh, later broke. Uh, I say well, Iraq. But, I, mean, I well, don't mean to say Iraq. Just, I mean the Sudan... The Saddam Hussein crime family, which considered itself to be, and in fact was, well, that's, that's the, the, owner of the, the owner of everybody and all property within Iran. Well, first of all, that's a separate matter from the invasion per se, which just had been dealt with. So I, I don't think that particular leg of your argument holds up. Now, you're right. Uh, subsequently, as a result of the invasion, Iraq agreed to, to do some things with respect to its nuclear weapons, and you say that another justification uh, is fooling around with uh, weapons of mass destruction, another justification for invasion. That strikes me as the most ridiculous of the four, because, of course, Iraq had let the inspectors in, and they, they were not denied access to a single facility that they asked to inspect, and there's no doubt... Uh, that if George Bush had been earnest about wanting to find out if there were indeed ongoing infractions, uh, he could have gotten for the rest of eternity pretty much to continue searching for weapons in exchange for holding off the invasion. So the idea that we had to invade to find out that they didn't have nuclear weapons is, is ridiculous. On, no, well, the, the question of the great thesaurus of the United Nations resolutions that was uh, accumulated by the diplomacy over the years, was this. Would Iraq come into compliance with the resolutions that confirmed its disarmament? And now you're not going to tell me that you think Iraq ever came into compliance. The, the a bizarre thing observed by many people inside and outside Iraq was the apparent unwillingness of Saddam Hussein to admit he didn't have weapons, even if he didn't. He wanted people to think that he did. He wanted to keep everybody permanently on tenterhooks. They never came into compliance. That's why... Uh, the, United, the United Nations Security Council voted unanimously uh, before the business of the second resolution was brought up by Mr. Blair uh, to say that they, they weren't in compliance and serious consequences would naturally follow. I, I myself would have thought that was authority enough. I wish the second resolution debate had so, not been so allowed to muddy the waters. His, you didn't take his admitting the inspectors and letting them go wherever they wanted as a way of saying, no, I he don't didn't have let, he didn't let them. He did not let them go wherever they wanted. He wouldn't allow, for example, he you two. He absolutely did. No. And, well, and I encourage people to fact check this and come up with a yeah. single facility, Christopher. Come up with a single facility. I don't expect you to have it at your fingertips now, but I would like somebody to point to a facility to which the inspectors were denied well, you're barking access. up the wrong tree there. For example, the inspectors were not allowed to take Iraqi scientists out of the country to true. interview them. That is true. They weren't allowed to use the U-2 overflights. There was in existence a ministry of concealment, an actual office of the Iraqi state run by one of Saddam Hussein's mm -hmm. sons, designed mm -hmm. for the bamboozlement of inspectors. Rolf Akias, who I know very well, who was the head of the UN inspectorate in the first round and whose reappointment was blocked by France and Russia for reasons mm -hmm. that are too obvious to go into, told me he was offered a direct bribe by Tariq Aziz, the uh, foreign minister of Saddam Hussein, to try and alter his reports. Uh, if they asked Rolf Akias, it means they would try to bribe Everybody, we have no reason to think that it didn't work at least some of the time as the oil for food program was being used to corrupt the United Nations 
process as well. And we know from the memoirs of Dr. Mario Bedi, Saddam Hussein's chief nuclear scientist, that he himself was ordered to bury a centrifuge in his garden and did. And we have the open well, record. We? Of, we, we have the open record of that being dug up and shown on, on camera. We, we, that was all for anyone to see. They, they tried to bury what they had against the day when the sanctions would break down and Saddam Hussein would be out of his famous box. The presumption of guilt in the case of Saddam Hussein and double dealing on WMD is absolute. Well, well then, uh, but the but the accusation was that he had nuclear weapons and an active nuclear program. No, actually, it wasn't and, that he had nuclear weapons. It was that he had and an had, active had, nuclear or program had plan, or had a plan to reacquire and maintain the expertise to right. And it's uh, not uh, chemical and, it's, and biological weapons. Yes. And if you have and if you have the free run of the country and can go anywhere you want, it's not hard to establish whether that is not is or is not the case. How many inspectors were there? You know, if you know as well as How I do, big is Iraq? Iraq? you know as well as I do that if George Bush had been earnest and had not just been looking for an excuse to invade and had said at the last minute, I will hold off on invasion if we we multiply by ten the number. Uh, of inspectors and give them another two years, you know damn well the Security Council would have done it in a minute. And in any event, if he didn't think they would, he could have tried. But he didn't try because he didn't want to avoid the war. Now, it's fine to point to technical senses in which Saddam Hussein was still in noncompliance. But if what you're saying is there was some kind of serious effort to, to find out whether he had nuclear weapons, and in the end, invasion was the only option, that is utter nonsense, and I, I think you would have to agree well, the, to that. the right? president's speech to the United Nations on September 11, 2002, mentions that as only one of four major objections to the continuing private ownership of Iraq by this psychopathic uh, crime family. But I think it's good enough because, as an argument, yes, because it, uh, it, that regime was the only one that we knew had both acquired and concealed the acquisition of and the manufacture of and then later used on neighbors and on its own population weapons of mass destruction. Now, that's a, that's a very grave state of affairs. It wasn't punished at the time it should have been, but it's been punished now. And I, well, find, I, find, I, I find I'm not sorry that Saddam Hussein is no longer... The private owner of Iraq with his with his terrible twin, not twins, his terrible son. Oh, I'm not sorry about that part. The, the two, the, the, there there are just other questions. That's definitely an upside. I mean, I, I think perhaps more than you, I will concede the upside of policies I oppose. Most policies have some upsides, but but uh, right now, I mean, to, to focus on that right there, you're talking about a uh, onfall. The the uh, you know the, um, the which you know people argue about whether whether it uh, comports with the definition of genocide in the strictest sense. But leave that aside. The, the fascinating thing about that is, as you know, the American government was a supporter of, of Saddam Hussein's when he conducted that cam- campaign. In its aftermath, absolutely, and with, when, with considerable knowledge of the fact that he had conducted it, yes. the American government, if anything, redoubled its support of Saddam I, Hussein, um, and in fact, I'm shared with painfully him. well aware of that. Yeah, and yeah. To draw so it's a little time. bit. So it's, it's a little that bit ironic. Me, that, that, that seems to me absolutely to undermine your main point. The more that's true, the more we incur the responsibility to put right what we did wrong before. Oh, I see. So we can, we can abet a horrible crime, and then we are the policeman who punishes the other guy that we abetted without punishing ourselves. This, this leads to a larger point, the absurdity. No, I'm sorry. I mean, I if, if, you, if, you find you, if you find you've been complicit in a terrible crime against humanity, which the unfair crime was, and you seem to uh, argue a moment ago that it doesn't fit the uh, definition of genocide. It certainly, no, fits the definition, it certainly fits the definition that says that there is a plan to exterminate, in, in whole or in part, the national existence of, of a people. If you find you've been, a, a, under a previous regime, another incarnation, as a nation responsible for that, I would say it doubles your responsibility to cancel that obligation. Now, see, this, wouldn't, this you, leads, wouldn't you want to agree? This leads to another point. The, the, the idea of America having been an accomplice to this crime, then getting in high dudgeon about the crime and invading him on the basis of it. The irony of that underscores a larger point hovering over this whole discussion of international law. I'm not sure I see the irony there. What? 
You don't see the irony. irony is well, word that's very I think to irony you. at a minimum it qualifies as. You know, whether it's maybe we could have an argument as to whether it's a it's a paradox that should cripple the policy you advocate, but I don't think anyone would deny irony, Chris. Well if only irony was just paradox. No, it's actually something that's rather literal rather than ironic. You you have incur by being not just a bystander, which would have been bad enough, but as you correctly point out, an accomplice in a terrible crime against humanity. It seems to me you acquire, you, you definitely take upon yourself the responsibility to <clears throat> redeem that uh, horrific uh, complicity and neutrality. And I'm well, very glad to say that instead of filling mass graves in, in, in Iraq, the United States is now helping the Iraqi and Kurdish people to dig them up and to put on trial those who murdered them. This brings us to a larger point, the idea of the United States taking on that responsibility. Uh, and no, not taking, taking on. on. Uh, no, be, no, excuse me, that's exactly the opposite word. Not taking on. Accepting, realizing, saying yes, it's true. We, 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 can't, we can't wash our hands of this. It, 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 okay, in any event, I mean, th th there's a larger question hovering over our discussion of international law here. There's the, there's the question of... Uh, of of, of, of whether, whether you know, uh, you, you delineated these crimes that you say uh, qualifies under international law. I, I actually think there's a problem probably with each of them, um, including, you know, uh, the question of why we didn't punish him at the time. And, and I would say in the case of his undeniably abetting terrorism, well, if we invaded every country that abets terrorism, first of all, we'd be invading uh, some allies. We'd be invading Pakistan now, not to get the Taliban, to get the government, okay, because they have, uh, I think you'd agree, Pakistan has abetted uh, terrorism, that seems to me not, I, not a well, policy we're consistently enforcing. So, yes. yes, and indeed In we, might, God. we might on reflection invade ourselves, given the fact that we have supported things like extra-legal death squads, uh, who, who, which, are, if they're morally distinct in an important way from terrorism, it's a distinction that eludes me, okay? But above, uh, again, hovering above all of well, this... Well, then what you just said would be a very convenient way of making all, all moral action impossible. Well, it would, you're it would making make, the best it would enemy make people, of the good, and, it would make and you're denying the, the possibility of doing even a bit of good. No, I've actually got a, I've actually got a, a, a way to get around that, which leads to the point I've been trying to, ah. to get at. Hovering above all of this discussion of international law is, is this, the separate question of who is authorized to enforce it. If I go in and break down my neighbor's door, and I say, look, there are illegal drugs in here, and there indeed are, that does not mean I've acted lawfully, right? No, now, I wouldn't say so. Now, something. some of us who are very serious uh, about constructing a system of international law that will really merit the term, which admittedly we may not have here, would like, whenever possible, to actually exercise the, the legitimate mechanisms of enforcement of international law. In this case, the Security Council, okay, not the United States. If we let every country, if you said it was legitimate for every country in the world to go around invading anyone that they deemed guilty of any of the four things that you just outlined, the world would be chaos, okay, if, if that freedom were actually exercised. Some of us would rather rely on a, 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 a body of international law like the Security Council which, of course, has often been paralyzed and inactive, and ironically, in this case, had been unprecedentedly effective in, in, in getting the inspectors into Iraq to determine whether Iraq was or was not guilty of the primary allegation against it. And, 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 and I really to comply. regret, and I think one of the costs of the Iraq War was that we let that potentially valuable uh, precedent uh, not only wither, but it became, it kind of backfired. It, 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 it made nations, if anything, less inclined to to uh, comply with the dictates of the uh, of the Security Council. If, if, no. if after all, you're going to get invaded, whether you do or uh, whether you uh, comply with the fundamental spirit of it or not. No. So, so there so is. So that this, you you would you I, I don't, it's hard to know quite at which point to. There's uh, one point: the U.S. is not judge, oh, jury, and executioner, sorry. Christopher. That's the point. That it's just a no. simple point. So you think, say, that the the uh, self-evident flouting of all the laws of governing non-proliferation by the current regime in Iran um, has uh, is is not opposed by Russia or China? Just because they don't, they think the Americans made a mistake in Iraq. The, the Russians and Chinese would otherwise be in full compliance with the Security Council and saying yes, it's true. 
the Iranians have broken all the rules, we have to do something about it. No, I don't believe that. Why, no, why I don't do you think, think I, I don't, did? I didn't, I really, I'm so glad to hear you don't. Um, so take another case, uh, Rwanda, where the United States actually vetoed the uh, proposal to double the strength of the UN force preemptively because they knew that the genocide was in preparation. Everybody knows now how terrible our abstinence and our neutrality were. They're, they weren't even neutral in the end. It was abstention on behalf of the genocide of the, of the, of the Hutu um, mass murderers. Now, suppose it had been the other way. The UN says, right, we, we, should, we should send a vast mission of aid and defense to Rwanda and do it swiftly so as to prevent the near extermination of half its people. Which um, member state do you think would have got the job of actually producing the planes, the troops... The, the massive drops of food and medicine and so on. You know very well it wouldn't have been Belgium, it wouldn't have been China, it wouldn't have been Russia either. The United States is not just the host country and the, one of the founder countries of, of the United Nations, it's the, it's the one without which it doesn't work. And, for example, right. if your advice had been followed, the, the, uh, Slobodan Milosevic would still be, the, well, he, he might actually have died by now of natural causes, but he would have spent some time being the president of a greater Serbia that included... Uh, a destroyed Bosnia, a massacred Bosnia, and a cleansed Kosovo. Uh, no, 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 the actually, United States, in my opinion, quite rightly decided actually, to save, the, to save by the way, I'll add this, the Muslim populations of the Balkans, the Kosovo mm -hmm. and Bosnian ones, on a NATO initiative, and said that since the United Nations is never going to do anything about this, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean we have to watch the recrudescence of national socialism in Europe. I thought that was a great thing, and I think it should be added to what we'd said earlier, that why doesn't Major Hassan say, well, you have to give it to the United States. If it wasn't for them, all the Muslims of, of mm -hmm. Balkan Europe would have been killed. Mm -hmm. No one ever says that. That can't, no, no action is attributable to a U.S. action like that. It's only attributable to the U.S. when it's the other way around, supposedly, that we actually saved Kuwait, a Muslim country, from destruction. We saved Afghanistan from right. beggary and slavery. We saved um, Iraq from a, a, a terrible fascist dictator and the Iraqi people, the, the, the Shia majority of whom are very grateful to us, and the Kurdish ones too, none of this is ever counted in, is it? When the, when well, the, when the question of terrorism and irrational theocratic violence is being discussed. You're kind of changing the... Uh, the, the you're kind of, uh, you know, you, you're, move, you're covering a lot of things here, let's say. The, well, I'm uh, trying to make the, consistent with our earlier discussion. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, you said that, that if I had my way, we would not have intervened in Bosnia. A, I can point you to columns I wrote long before the American government finally decided to, to support intervention there, advocating intervention. B... What uh, about the, the UN? What, what, if the, what if the UN is against, as it was? Uh, actually, I don't think the UN, uh, in the end, I think that did get UN support, did it not? It, it was, in any event... It, it the, doesn't the reason, matter, because the, it, it certainly wasn't done with the United Nations permission. Uh, I think it had, in any event, what I argued at the time was that this was actually a clear-cut uh, violation on a couple of grounds, okay? It was, uh, first, there was trans-border aggression because the boundaries uh, within the former Yugoslavia had already been recognized uh, when that was taking place. So Serbia was cross, it was trans-border aggression, as I said, it was, yes. and, and unlike, unlike the case you bring up with Saddam Hussein, it wasn't something that had happened 10 years ago and already been punished, as with the Kuwait invasion. It was happening now. Uh, the ethnic cleansing slash genocide uh, was happening now, okay? So it's not at all comparable to what you're talking about in Iraq. It, no, we, I, was we, only, we I, was only, I was only saying, we, uh, sorry, I was addressing myself anyway, to your view. I was addressing myself I, to your view derived, I'm not quite sure from where, that the only lawful authority for the use of force in international relations is the Security Council of the, of the United Nations. I don't think that, that is a very easy view to hold, if you're as consistent as I, I, I doubt not, you are, I would not say, about things like human rights and genocide. I would not say that if there is a clear-cut, for example, ongoing genocide, uh, you should be paralyzed by the Security Council's failure to act. Uh, I concede... That, that the bodies of international law have not yet evolved to a point where we can rely on them wholly. Well, how are you uh, thinking about Iran now, for example? I mean, what, what more proof do you need that the Iranian regime is outside well, the law, both, a, at home, both at home and abroad? The United Nations, do you expect the United Nations to take up this responsibility? I'll ask well, you a straight question. This is another case where, uh, first of all... Uh, do you or don't you expect them to take it up? What's that? Do you expect the United Nations to become seized of the fact, the matter, 
uh-huh. that Iran is in absolutely open, contemptuous defiance of all the treaties it's ever signed, all the undertakings it's ever made to the European Union, to the International Atomic Energy Authority, to the NPT, and to the UN itself. Do you suppose that now the United Nations, faced with this undeniable well, state of affairs, is going to help to disarm Iran? Do you or don't you? Iran raises two questions. If you ask me what I would like the Security Council to do... No, um, I didn't ask you that. Why, why, you why, why since I did ask you a direct question, why pick the one I didn't ask? Okay, what'd you ask? What'd you ask? Do you expect the United Nations to live up to its evident responsibilities in this respect? Um, actually, I think it's it's not so clear here what the evident responsibilities are. There, there's, uh, no. th- there's, uh, you know, it, it's it's really. I think. I mean, experts tell me it's not it's not so clear uh, that we would have to stop anything Iran is doing is evidently doing to keep it in compliance. Uh, with a non-proliferation treaty, what we would have to do, and this I would support, and this is something we have not offered Iran, by the way, in the terms I, I'm about to describe. We have not said to Iran, if you if you let inspectors go wherever they want, more or less, uh, in, in keeping with the so-called additional protocol to the NPT, you can enrich uh, nuclear materials for verifiably peaceful purposes. As long as we can monitor, and these inspectors can go not only to declared sites... But wherever they want, we will let you enrich. That's a deal we have not offered them in those terms. We have, we, have, we have said things like, if you let inspectors in, then as confidence grows, and we'll be the ones who determine when confidence has grown, then we may let you uh, enrich and so on. This is a deal that I think uh, would keep Iran within the bounds of the NPT, uh, but, but uh, it is more likely to accept than anything we've offered. So if you've asked me what I'd like to see, I'd like mm-hmm. to see that. Now, there's a, right. there, no, there's I, a I'd larger... Like to, I'd like to see that, too. I really would. Well, there's a large... And, and it's one of these things where why not at least make the offer? Okay, maybe they'd turn it down. Why not at least make the offer? And yet it's not even official American policy sure, why to want to make it that offer. Run, it, sure, why not? It helps them run out the clock. It helps them think that this is too easy. Uh, it confirms them in their existing long record of contempt and bad behavior. Why not? It's it's certainly consistent with everything we've done so far. Okay, so then, uh, so you're you're against it, I take it. No, I'm 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 for for trying it too, just to convince the last doubter. Why not? Why not? But I don't think we have an infinity of time before we have a theocracy that's at war with its own people and threatening its neighbors that will be able to say to us, what do you propose to do about us now that we have thermonuclear capacity? Well, by the way, speaking of uh, the people that it's at war with, I know one of the criteria by which you make a lot of foreign policy decisions is you're supporting, uh, supportive of the forces of, of democracy. So am I, all other things being equal. There is this irony in Iran, which is that the so-called good guys, the forces of democracy, seem more obstinate even than Ahmadinejad in this particular case. According to the criminologists, if they're to be trusted, Ahmadinejad was in favor of the deal where, whereby their nuclear materials would have been transported to Russia, and the opposition, and maybe what the critical mass was in the opposition, came uh, from, among other places, from the reformers. But uh, I, I don't want to get in the way of your... Uh, no, of, there, are, uh, there are nationalists among the reformers, that's true. Right. There's no question about it. Uh, but the, the, the consistent finding that all measurements, some of them are obviously limited and crude of measurements of opinion in Iran, where I've been myself and made some inquiries, uh, the, the very consistent finding is that the majority of Iranians want the restoration of full diplomatic relations with the United States and, and friendship with America. Now, they, they have to know that the price of that is not that they give up their nuclear program, but that they give up a nuclear weapons program. We'll build them the reactors. We've said we'd like them to have nuclear <coughs> uh, capacity because it's so much better than, than squandering their oil. And such reactors as they do have were mostly built, in any case, by the United States. They, they can have... All that and the lifting of the embargo as well, and a lot of prosperity and free exchange, that's what they want. You're telling, I don't think it's true the Iranian people, given that offer, if they were allowed to vote in their own name and create a government that was in their own image, would say, no, we care so much about the weaponry that we don't want any of that. All the evidence is to the contrary. It's very important, I think, that we, we become, I say we, not just the United States, people like you and I, uh, become firmer and f- faster friends of the Iranian democratic movement and ask ourselves every day, what have we done to help them? 
Well, I'm certainly not against their, their taking over, uh, you know, I mean, but, uh, but there is just one, you know, one larger issue that, that I think frames the Iran, the Iran uh, case, and that is just, you know, you ask what should the Security Council do? Well, one problematic thing, and I'm sure this seems especially problematic from the point of view of some Iranians, is just a massive inconsistency. Uh, the, the fact that we have let the, 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 the idea of, of, a, of a consistent non-proliferation r- regime just completely uh, fall apart. I mean, uh, for example, if Iran um, tomorrow said, in keeping with the terms of the NPT, we're getting out of the NPT, we're opting out, which you're allowed to do under the NPT, and we're going to build nuclear weapons, then they would have exactly the same standing as Israel, Pakistan, and India. And yet I don't think you would, would, would uh, really ch- fundamentally change uh, your view of what should, we should do about Iran. And, and granted, the Iranian regime, of, of all those four regimes, the current Iranian regime is the one I would least like to have nuclear weapons in the hands of. But the larger point is, we are not, you know, we're not able to say to the Iranian people, here is this general principle that we expect you to abide by, that we would expect, expect any nation to abide by. And until we are able to well, do that... that's not quite true, because what Iran is doing is building a, a weapons capacity while remaining a signatory of the NPT. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't know that they want per se, Christopher. Yes, we we do. do not know if they have violated the NPT in, the, in, in a technical sense, I think. At least there are people who know more about it than I do that argue that. Um, well, I congratulate them on their lenience and... Um, Me too. Broad-mindedness. The fact is that I, if it was up to me, the Pakistanis, for example, would never have been able to acquire nuclear weapons by piracy um, and secret dealing and theft as they did, let alone to share those um, fissile materials with Libya, uh, North Korea, and others through the nuclear Walmart that we allowed them to run under the regime of AQ Khan, but I might just add here on the point of non-proliferation, the AQ Khan network would never have been uncovered <clears throat> if Colonel Gaddafi had not turned over all his fissile materials to the United States, or potentially fissile ones, and his arsenal, and he wouldn't have done that if it hadn't been for the deposition of Saddam Hussein. So actually the, the, the contribution of the intervention in Iraq to non-proliferation globally and in general has been greatly underestimated. Oh, I beg to but differ. If, but, beg because, to differ. but because it, it's, it's not my fault... Uh, or yours, uh, that the um, states of Pakistan and Israel and others have unlawfully acquired nuclear weapons. But we are faced now with a very aggressive state that's at war with its own people and threatens its neighbors, that uses messianic rhetoric, becoming a thermonuclear power. Now, anything, if you, I just don't like the idea of you wanting to change the subject there. That, that's true, whatever else I, I told you what I would do about it, and I told you why... Um, you didn't say what you'd do about it. Oh, what, you'd make them a better offer on inspections? The deal I would offer Iran, yes. Okay. And, and, and look, if it were my world, you said in your world, Pakistan wouldn't have acquired nuclear weapons. Well, okay, fine, but, but from the Iranian's well, look, point of view, I mean, the question is... If we're why allowed to do all that, to... I mean, I admit, if we're allowed to do all that, I mean, if it was up to me, there would be no such place as Pakistan. India would never right. have been partitioned, the great post-colonial crime of the British Empire, the greatest probably of all. And if, and if it were up to me, there would be uh, various larger initiatives being looked at with regard to Iran, which are not politically feasible. Me too. Uh, but, 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 you know, your point about uh, Iraq having contributing to nonproliferation because it may be that it's what led Libya to fess up about its nuclear weapons. There's I mean, no let, me just take, let me just take issue with you there. Even if I grant you that hypothetical, well, not hypothetical, but the unknown, what, what exactly uh, uh, caused Gaddafi to make up his mind on that, it could well be the war granted. Uh, a, it equally could well be the case, as I speculated at the time, that once North Korea saw that even if you let inspectors in, uh, you get invaded anyway, that, that significantly reduced the chances that they would play ball with the international community. And, of course, they've since demonstrably developed nuclear weapons. Okay, A, and that is, is, is to me, as plausible a consequence of the Iraq war as the one you posited. But, but B, more broadly, as I said, <clears throat> what the United Nations had accomplished, and, and thanks to George Bush, it, I, I would add, it was only under the threat of the troops he was amassing that Saddam Hussein let the UN inspectors in. But the fact is, so what you'd never that, say was, is. that was a vital uh, precedent 
that could have done great things to nurture the ongoing evolution of a, of a non-proliferation regime. In, instead, the opposite happened. This evolution was sabotaged by George Bush. And I still say, on balance, the Iraq War was very bad for the non-proliferation cause. Well, I spoke to the British diplomat who had been the ambassador in Tripoli. He was, he was, then, when I met him, he was in Iran at the time, who said that Gaddafi was induced to give up. And remember, he gave up his weapons and he offered his surrender of them, not to Chirac, not to Putin, not to Kofi Annan, not to the European Union. He, he went first to Blair and then to Bush, suggestive in itself. We got him in three ways. One, we had very good intelligence, better than we had in Iraq, I'll freely concede. We shocked him when we went to him and said how much we knew. Third, the Lockerbie business, second, I mean, the Lockerbie business was becoming totally oppressive to him. The, the Scottish courts were never going to let up. And three, he was terrified by what he'd seen happen to Saddam Hussein. And when he handed over his material, it was more than we thought he had, mm -hmm. and more advanced as well. It's all mm -hmm. in Oak Ridge, Tennessee now, a good place for it to be. But by analyzing it, said, where the hell did he get this? We walked back the cat. It can only have come from Pakistan. And we shut down much too late the AQ Khan network. I think that's a generally positive thing. Robert, to go back to what you were saying before about North Korea, I'm mm -hmm. sorry to say, I, I keep finding this, this note of what I'll call masochism in, in, in your argument. Whenever anyone behaves badly, it's because they think we've been mean to them or we've been cruel to them, we've been nasty to them. That's not it's what been, I said been, about North Korea, been, but You anyway. did. You said, you, they said the lesson the North no, Korea I drew said, was we, if we let in inspectors and gave them free access, you know, it would do us no good. Don't you understand that the whole North Korean state is based upon the idea that there will have to be an ultimate war with, with American imperialism, that there's, that there's nothing we can do to make them behave any better, that they're, they're absolutely committed to this course of folly. They've starved their own people till they're six inches shorter than a South Korean to make this happen. The, the, the idea that if we were more warming and gentle to them, that they would be less aggressive is ridiculous. And, very, and I think very dangerous, as well as, well as I have to say, somewhat humiliating. I, I, I don't consider my hatred of and suspicion of, of the North Korean regime to be the contributing cause to the revolting way in which it treats its neighbors and its people. No, you have I to learn say, to call these things by their right names. I didn't say that our treatment of North Korea had, is what had contributed to its behavior. I had said... Uh, it's, it's at least possible, and, and, and uh, my, my, my view uh, of, of the intrinsic and eternal of obstinance of, of the regime is, is not quite as severe as yours. I, I grant that, you know, it's kind of a tough case. Um, but, but what I said was that their assessment of the carrots and sticks that we, subs that we were laying out and continued to lay out uh, was colored by, by what they had seen uh, in, in Iraq, when uh, Iraq came into essential compliance uh, with the fundamentals of what we ask in terms of letting in inspectors, and we invaded uh, and deposed their ruler and ultimately killed him anyway. That, that's not a way to encourage people to let inspectors into their country. I think you'd agree. But, uh, you know, as long as we're on the subject of upsides and downsides so that's of the why Iraq they, war... that's why they fire a missile right across Japan. Without warning, the Japanese find one day a missile has been launched, no. flies over their country and lands on the sea on the other side. Of course that's going to happen because the United States uh, invaded Iraq. No, I don't think that. I don't, no, no, no. You'll be happy no. to hear I, I don't see a causal relationship there. So we agree on really? that. But as long as we're on the subject of the costs and benefits of the Iraq war, but there's one, I mean, we're running out of time. There's one I'd like to ask about in particular. I think everyone agrees that the situation in Pakistan, where you have a, a radical insurgency... Uh, and you have nuclear weapons, is massively more dangerous than anything that uh, we now know we actually faced in Iraq. Pretty much everyone agrees that the focus on, on the Iraq war distracted us from the whole Afghanistan-Pakistan region in a way that exacerbated that situation. I would think that that alone is a comes close to being a damning indictment of the Iraq war. You obviously must disagree because you still think the yeah. Iraq war was a good idea. So what, do you not concede well, any connection between those I, I've two? I've always thought that's a totally bogus argument, if you don't mind my using that word, because Iraq was in our future no matter what. We can't say, because of Afghanistan, we cancel Iraq. We, we, this huge country on the Gulf that's the, at a choke point of the world economy, exactly between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Sorry to the Iraqis and to everyone else. We can't pay attention to that now. We're all tied up in Afghanistan. That would be not just to cease to be a superpower, it would be to cease to be a thinking country, 
at all. Iraq, unfortunately, forced itself upon us, and I think that, in a very, admittedly, very clumsy and incompetent way, we finally lived up to long inherited responsibility. Uh, it was, I, I it was see how Iraq, but, however, I, see how Iraq I also think you're itself. wrong at the other end of your syllogism in that everything we needed to know about the danger from Pakistan and in Pakistan was available to us and should never have, uh, attention, I should, for no reason at all, or under no pressure, have, have, um, have wavered. Uh, I wrote an article which you can look up easily. It's in a, it's in a collection of mine called uh, Love, Poverty and War. Long report from Pakistan just after 9-11, long before any real confrontation with Iraq was in the, was in the offing, saying exactly why this, this is a terrifyingly dangerous place. There was out, no, no, no one, if you, 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 are, you are exculpating any American official who didn't do their job in pointing to that danger, if you say them, to them, allow them the exit clause, oh, well, I was, we were all so busy with Iraq we couldn't be bothered. No, we were a long-term, very heavy commitment in Pakistan. And we played it wrong, and we still are playing it wrong. It's not because of Iraq that we fail to see that Pakistan still wants Afghanistan as its colony, and that it invented the Taliban in order to have a, a dependency, a client well, state in Afghanistan. Well, and it did that long before 9-11. And that it wants to do this because it wants strategic depth for a war with India mm -hmm. over Kashmir, and that it is India, the only other multi-ethnic, multicultural, secular, democratic superpower in the world of that scale, that we should be making an alliance. Our whole policy now is dead wrong with the AFPAC keyhole through which we look at these things because it ignores the two potential superpowers in the region, India and Iran. Getting those two things right are what's important. Okay, the... Um, Iraq makes no difference to this argument at all. Let me do two things, uh, you know, running out of time. Well, first, I'll just, for the record, say I don't accept your contention that Iraq was uh, foisting itself upon us as a major security problem and was bound to remain one. I, I just think, you know, uh, we, we actually, in fact, no one, no one was even claiming that Iraq had an actual nuclear weapon or a true biological weapon in the sense of a, a biological weapon that is contagious and for which we lack a vaccine. No, I don't mean the weapons threat, Robert. I'm sorry. I mean the fact that Iraq was a country falling to pieces on the Gulf. It was because of the sanctions, which were necessitated sounds, by refusal like to come into compliance. To me, but, you know. And because of the, the fascistic nature of the regime, we were looking at another country like Congo or Rwanda turning into a black hole on the Gulf. A, a terrible, maimed, wrecked, yeah. traumatized place, as, as indeed has partially happened in spite of the intervention. Well, Some yesterday, five bombs blew up in Baghdad and killed over 100 people. So I wouldn't say, looking at that and the, and the previous uh, six years, we entirely avoided mm. chaos in Iraq. But well, I know, that, I know the last people, I, I already know the last people who are going to blame for those bombs are the people who rigged them and set them off. There must well, be better explanation say, I'm than I'm that, say, according to I'm you. Not, it's not a question of blame. The people who set those, those bombs are culpable. I would but say, it's, a, yeah. it's a fact of the matter that had we not invaded Iraq, those five bombs would not have been set off. And, and we're, we're closing this with the distinction I was trying to drive home at the beginning, the distinction between a clear causal analysis and the question of blame. If you cannot divorce yourself, if you cannot divorce those two things, if you continue to conflate them, yes. as right-wing propagandists love to do, you will never be able to get clear I'm on the consequences of foreign policy. I'm curious to ask you, do you think the policy? bombs in the, in the Madrid train station and in the London subway system are also a result of the invasion of Iran? Uh, you know, I don't know enough. I suspect that they might not have happened, but I don't know. But in any event, the people who set them are hmm. culpable, are culpable for those bombs. Let me say, okay, so anyway, as I said, I wanted to do two things in closing. One is just uh, assert that, for the record, I don't buy that party premise. The other is, let me close by, A, giving you the last word, and, and, and B, uh, perhaps self-servingly, uh, giving it to you in a realm where I'm not positive I disagree with you anyway. Um, it's, this, uh, it's this question about Afghanistan and Pakistan. I feel so unsure on what the smart thing to do is in that realm, and you sound like you have some ideas. So in closing, I would let you, first of all, just, A, say whatever you want to say, and I promise not to reply about anything you said, but B, I would like to hear your, uh, your what, what your recommendation is about uh, that, that what we do in Afghanistan and Pakistan now. Well, it's very generous of you, but, but I mean, I don't, I don't feel I need a free kick, as it were. That's, I think the two things that are wrong with the president's speech are, first, the sense of history, and, sen and second, the sense of geography. 
This is actually a historic engagement uh, that we have with that region, and it's part of being the United States. There's no sense in which we can disengage or withdraw from. It's pure art, I think so, and we have to think in terms of decades and centuries. Um, and he thinks in terms of electoral cycles, and that was pathetically obvious and made him do the self-evidently silly thing of roughly speaking, saying how we will strengthen our hand by announcing when we'll fold it. They've been playing catch-up on that trivial point ever since. This is going to go on for the rest of my life and my children's lives, this confrontation. Second, it's wrong geopolitically. The, the, the narrow, the little tiny telescope with which we look at it, the so-called AFPAC, is a provincial and parochial uh, perspective. The, the critical thing is, uh, is to get right our relationship with the, with the great secular multicultural democracy, India, which is the regional superpower. Currently, we seem to be saying we take the Pakistani side in that quarrel. We don't, explicitly said by General McChrystal, we don't want India interfering in Afghanistan, where it's been a big help in, in uh, providing aid and uh, money and uh, materials to the Afghan people as it was to the Northern Alliance who were fighting the Taliban before we were. And second, if we don't get Iran right, if we don't find a way of putting ourselves simultaneously, and again, it's history and geopolitics, on, for the first time in our history, on the democratic side in Iran, on the side of the people, and against their oppressors who are trying to guarantee themselves against regime change, as Saddam Hussein did by the illegal acquisition of nuclear weapons. So we don't get that right as well. Uh, we are done for in this area. So what I, what I would like is a president who had some sense of history, had some sense of geopolitics, and also some sense of the right side to be on. Actually, it's quite possible to get all those three things in alignment. And I think it's impossible to have a policy that doesn't, by the way. Or any policy that doesn't do all three is doomed. It's not even stopgap. We're okay. rewarding the Pakistani regime that invented and still sponsors the Taliban. If we're paying, we, we, we put it like this, we pretend to pay them to stop doing it, and they pretend to stop doing it while taking the money. This is A, humiliating, short-term, and, and limited, and three, um, doomed to fail. Um, okay, well, as I said, I, I, I'll let you have the last word. Well, uh, you would be, I mean, I almost wondered how much more generous you'd be. Thank you anyway. <laughs> Uh, I enjoyed this. I always uh, enjoy your writing is inevitably thought provoking, Christopher. Thank you. And, and it, it provokes a number of reactions from me, and men I would say thought is among them. Um, and uh, and I thank you for coming on.